Hi, my name is Staff Sergeant Derek Banish from the 77th Army Band here at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And today I'm gonna to talk about bassoon reed design variables, or specifically how the choices we make in the construction and the design of our bassoon reeds can affect their performance and how we can alter them in order to better achieve our goals based on the kind of playing we do and the situations in which we find ourselves. I used to give this lecture uh, regularly when I was bassoon instructor at the U.S. Army and U.S. Navy Schools of Music in Virginia Beach from 2015 to 2019, and my students always found it useful, and so I would like to share some of what we've learned from designing bassoon reeds and looking at various bassoon reeds. We'd like to I'd like to share some of that with you. But before I get into the details of the lecture, I want to do a little bit of show and tell. I have always collected bassoon reeds. If I meet a new player or take a lesson with a teacher or meet a colleague, I'll usually ask if they have an old reed that I can have or that I can buy off of them just to add to my collection. I like to see what other people are doing. If I see a interesting looking reed for sale on the internet, I'll usually buy a couple just to kind of see if there's something that I can learn from it. So I've got quite a collection and I've chosen 10 that I want to show you and we'll talk about them later on in the talk. But for now, presented without comment, here are some of my bassoon reeds. So this first reed is one that I made myself in the Donzi style. The second reed is one that was made for me by Bob Williams, who is principal bassoonist of the Detroit Symphony Orchestra. The third here is made by Go Bassoon Reeds, a company that you can find online. Next up, we have an, another Italian read, this one from Andante Irondo. The next read is one from a read maker in Los Angeles. Next up, we have a read that was given to me by a former student and army colleague made by a professional bassoonist in Hawaii. The next read is a read uh, made by Delano Bassoon Reads. It's available for sale from Midwest Musical Imports. The next read is a read I made myself, uh, following the instructions for the tip taper read in the famous Lou Skinner read making book. Just to humble brag for a second, this is also probably the best read I've ever made. This is a read that is available uh, through Miller Marketing. Here's another read that's available through Miller Marketing. This is the KJI Yellow Bassoon Read. Here's a read that was made for me by my good friend Mark Ortwine in the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra. And the last read I want to show you is a read that was made by a read maker and teacher in Austin, Texas, made in the Sakakini Van Hoosen style. So why do I show you all these reads? Well, all of these reads at one point in their life cycle was what I would consider to be a really good read, a read that was performance ready, a read that would let it do the things that I needed to do. Now, many of them are several years old and well past their prime, so they probably don't work as well as they used to. I could soak them up and play them if I wanted to and see what they're, what they're looking like today. But at one point, all of these reads were what I would consider to be very good. Yet, 
None of these reeds looks alike. None of these reeds measures the same. If you were to take a ruler, take a dial indicator, and measure different thicknesses, different lengths, widths, all of these reeds look different, yet they all work really well. And the moral of the story is that there are as many different kinds of reed styles as there are bassoon players. Never let anyone tell you that there's only one way to make a reed. There, there isn't. There's as many ways to make a reed as there are bassoonists. In fact, anyone who tells you that there's only one way to make a reed is probably trying to sell you something. So with that in mind, let's talk about bassoon reed design variables. So before we get into the discussion of the design variables and the effects that they have, I feel like it's really important to talk about what actually makes a good bassoon reed a good bassoon reed. There's lots of diff different definitions that you can have for this, but I like two in particular that I use uh, in my own philosophy of reed making and when I teach. So the first part of it is that a good bassoon reed plays in tune at all dynamics, at all articulations, and in all registers. Simple enough. You want a reed that will basically let you do whatever the music requires you to do, whatever the situation. The other definition that complements that one is that a good bassoon reed both responds to the adjustments that you make to it. So if I scrape it or I crimp the wires with, with, my, with my pliers or whatever, the reed responds to what I'm intending to do, and that it also holds the adjustment, meaning if I scrape it to try to make it easier to play, five minutes later, it doesn't revert back to the way that it was. So those two things, a reed that satisfies all my musical demands and a reed that both responds to and holds adjustment are what I would refer to as a good bassoon reed. This is really important because I feel that, in a manner of speaking, the reed is actually the instrument that you're playing. The reed is the source of the sound. The reed is the source of the vibration. The bassoon itself is really just an expensive amp, a very expensive amp in many cases. One thing that you may have noticed in my previous slide was that I don't talk about tone anywhere in my definition of a good bassoon reed. Does that mean that I don't care about tone or that I don't think it's important to sound good when you play the bassoon? Of course I don't think that. But there are several reasons why I don't figure tone into my definition of a good reed. One is because tone is subjective. I can measure dynamics. I can measure intonation. I can measure response. I can do all those things with tuners and metronomes and a decibel meter if I wanted to, but how do you measure tone? We can only use words like dark, bright, buzzy, and really there's no agreement among bassoonists about what those mean, so tone is subjective. Another reason is that we don't have a standard bassoon tone. Throughout the world, there's a wide variety of acceptable timbres and tones. No two bassoonists sound alike, and frankly, I like it that way. There's regional variations, and even within the same country, different orchestras and different players, different soloists, have a different concept of what it means to sound good on the bassoon. And I wouldn't want to change that for anything. It's one of the things I like about our instruments so well. Another reason is that your tonal needs change based on where you're playing and what group you're playing in. If you're a concerto soloist, you're gonna have a different tonal concept than someone who plays second bassoon full time. And we'll talk more about that later. If you play in a really vibrant, lively concert hall regularly, you're gonna make reads that play different than someone who plays every gig in a different venue, like I do as an army musician. So having a a stable concept of tone doesn't necessarily work from bassoonist to bassoonist. But the most important reason I don't factor tone into this is because when you scrape a reed for tone, it's very dangerous because what sounds good to you up close in your practice room, in your office, in your studio, may or may not sound good and probably won't sound good in the concert hall due to the changes in sound waves that occur throughout distance. There's a lot that 
acousticians have done. Uh, Professor Hugh Cooper from the University of Michigan did quite a bit of study on this, and that's a topic for another lecture. But what you sound like in the practice room is not what you're going to sound like in the hall. And so I don't particularly find tone to be a helpful barometer for what makes a good read. So now we're ready to begin our conversation about bassoon read design variables. So as you can see, here are all the reads that I showed you in the first part of my talk. Take a second and just look over the various differences throughout them. As you can see, there are a lot. And we'll talk about some of those differences in just a second. But for now, see how many you can spot. So in the left-hand column here is a list of design variables between those different reads that my students and I came up with. This is by no means an exhaustive list. I'm sure there are more. These are just some of the more obvious ones. Now, to the right of them, I have created what I refer to as sort of an artificial dichotomy. And what I mean is that they're the two extremes that you can have that particular variable. And I'll walk you through what I mean by that. So our first variable is wire placement. And in our, our false sort of false dichotomy, wires can either be close together or they can be very far apart. Shapes of bassoon reeds can be narrow or they can be wide. Bassoon reed length, reeds can be short, reeds can be long. Profile, the profile can be very, very thick it can also be very, very thin. The tube of the reed can be very round or it can be very flat. The ratio of the length of the tube to the length of the blade. You could have a very long tube and a very short blade. You could have a very short tube with a very long blade. The bevel of the reed can be very heavy and aggressive or it can be very light or non-existent at all. And the cane itself, you can have cane that's very hard, and you can have cane that's very soft. Now, of course, there are middle grounds on all of these variables, but these two dichotomies are, two extremes, if you will, are useful because what do you think would happen if we had a reed where the wires were super close together, the shape was very narrow, the reed was short, with a really thick profile, you rounded the heck out of the tubes, you had a long tube with a short blade, you beveled the heck out of the back end, and you made it from super hard cane. You would have a reed that was so resistant that if you could even get a sound out of it, your head would probably explode while you were trying to play it. Now, contrary, what if you had a reed where the wires were super far apart, the shape was really wide, the reed was really long with really thin blades, you flattened the wires, there was a short, blade, short tube with a super long blade, you barely beveled it all, and you made it with the softest cane you could find. You would have a reed that was so thin that you could play it through your nose, and if the air even made it through, it would not be able to do anything that you wanted it to do, let alone sound good. So what's the point of all this? The point of this is that for each of these variables, bassoonists have to pick and choose which side of the spectrum they want each of these variables to be on. And I picked a few of the reads that I showed at the beginning, and we're gonna sort of analyze each one of them so that you can see which, uh, how they fall within these spectrums. The first one I want to look at is the Donzi style reed that I made a few years ago. If you look at it closely, the wires are very close together, but the shape is wide. It's sort of a medium length, I think it was about 55 millimeters, but the profile is very thick, as is the standard with this style of reed. The tube is fairly flat, which creates a, a, a closed aperture at the tip. The tube is very short, the blade is long, I did not bevel this reed, and it tends to work better on soft cane. So you can see that this reed pulls from both sides of the spectrum in its design. Next up, we have the Hawaii reed. 
You can see here that the first and second wire are very far apart, especially compared to the Donzi reed on the previous slide. The shape of this reed is very narrow. I don't know if you can necessarily tell that from the picture, but it is very narrow. There is hardly any flare going from the tube into the blade. The reed is very long, though, and the profile, if you were to measure the blades, is, are quite thin. The tube, especially at the second and third wire, is very round. It has a long tube and a very short blade. I don't know about the bevel, and I don't know about the, so the source of the cane that the reed maker used. Uh, like I said, this reed was given to me, so I don't know uh, the specifics of that. But again, looking at the ones we do know the answer to, you can see there's a combination of both the left end and the right end of that continuum. The KJI yellow reed has first and second wire that are close together, not as close as the Donzi, but definitely closer together than the Hawaii reed. The shape is fairly wide, especially the flare at the end of the blade. The reed itself is very long with a thick profile. However, the tube is round. The tube to blade ratio, we have another short tube with a long blade. I don't know about the bevel on this reed, and I would classify just based on the way it plays as a medium soft piece of cane. Again, variables chosen from both ends of the spectrum, but the reed works, the reed plays. The last of the reeds that I want to analyze from my collection is the Delano reed. The wires are sort of a medium average distance, not too close, not too far apart, especially if you compare them to some of the other reeds. The shape is moderately wide, but not as wide as some. It's overall a short reed. The profile is sort of smack dead in the middle if you were to compare it with the other ones. The tube is fairly round. The tube and the blade are almost equal in length. The uh, tube is slightly longer than the blade, but only slightly. Uh, based on the Hertzberg style that I know this reed was made from, I would classify this as a heavier bevel, and I don't know the source of the cane. So this one is sort of a right down the middle, but again, takes variable design variables from both sides of the spectrum. So what does this mean? Well, I liken it to a playground seesaw, except the goal is not to go up and down. The goal is to balance and to not have one side be skewed one way or another. As we saw and demonstrated back in an earlier slide, if you choose from the spectrum entirely from the left side or entirely from the right side, you'll end up with a reed that's not only not balanced, it's not playable. If you remember the analysis we did of the four reeds that I selected, they chose from both sides of the spectrum. And if we had done that similar analysis with every reed in the selection that I, that I showed at the beginning of the talk, you would find that that was the case. Remember I said that each of these reeds at one point was what I would have considered an excellent reed, one that was playable and ready to go for a concert. And that's because whoever designed the reed, whether it was me or whether it was someone that I had bought the reed or received it as a gift from, made the conscious choice to balance the reed using those design variables. When you change one of the design variables, you're going to skew your seesaw one direction or the other, and so it requires a change in something else in order to keep that balance. So for example, if I decide that I want to make my reeds thinner, I need to do something to counteract that, otherwise my reed is going to skew too far to one side or the other of my seesaw. Now, unless, however, my goal is to correct an already existing imbalance. So say for example, my reeds always tend flat and I decide I'm going to change something in their design in order to make them sharper. I don't then need to change something else because my goal is to correct an imbalance. But if my reed is already balanced and I decide I want to experiment with something, then I will need to change something else in order to keep that balance. As we saw, there were 10 completely different reeds in my collection, and a balanced design looks different for everyone. And what that looks like is gonna be based on a variety of factors, including the bassoon that you play on, your personal physiology, and the performance requirements that you have for your particular job or in whatever way you make music.
Since I've already established that I like false dichotomies in this lecture, I'm going to make another one. And I'm going to say that reed making and bassoon playing in general is a constant tug of war between pure stability and pure flexibility. And what I mean by that, by pure stability, is that you always know where every note is going to be every single time. There's very little, if any, margin for error, but there's also little to any variation in what you're able to do. What I mean by pure flexibility is that you've got the complete freedom to play as loud or soft or bend pitch however you want. However, you don't always know how to control it. And so the tug of war between those two, we have to find some place in the middle to be able to have some flexibility and some stability. Now, where you fall on this spectrum is going to depend on your, the performance requirements that you have. Different jobs, different performance situations are going to require more flexibility or more stability. If I am a full-time second bassoonist in an orchestra, I would say that I want to tend more on the stable side with my setup because I need to be able to play soft. I need to be able to play in tune. Projection is not as much a concern. The high register is not as much of a concern. If I'm playing full-time principal bassoon in an orchestra, I'm going to tend more on the flexible side. I'm going to be up in the tenor and upper registers. I'm going to need to project a little bit more for solos, and I'm going to need to be able to carry some of the melodic lines. But I don't want to get too flexible because I still need to be able to blend and play in tune with the rest of the woodwinds. If I am a full-time concert concerto soloist, then I can go even further into the flexibility realm because I don't need to blend. I need to project and be a soloist. It's my time to shine. In my current job as an army bassoonist, I need to be right smack dab in the middle because I don't play in just one situation. I play in lots. I go from playing in woodwind quintet to playing in concert bands to playing in outdoor ceremonial groups. And so since I have to sort of wear a bunch of different hats and be all things to all people, I kind of like to keep my spectrum as close to bullseye dead center as I can. Now, another factor that we haven't talked about yet is the bassoon that you play on. Just like certain redesigned variables have a more stable or a more flexible um, result, different bassoons are more stable and more flexible. Now, again, we could probably have a very lively debate about these, but I'm going to put them where I grouped them and I'll talk about why. So bassoons that I consider more stable are late series heckle, and by that I mean 10,000 series and higher, all of the long bore foxes, the Model 2s, the 601s, the 220s, the Yamaha 812 and 811 bassoons, the 200 and 222 series Moosman bassoons, the modern Puckner bassoons, and the Walter bassoons are all bassoons that I would consider more stable. They have solid intonation, you know where every note is going to be every time, and but they require a bit more work to be able to go into the extremes of dynamics or to bend the pitch the way that you might need to in certain situations. Bassoons that are more flexible are what I consider the older heckles, the 9000 series and lower, the short bore foxes, uh, 660s, 201s, Renard 240s, the Yamaha 821, the 100 and 150 series Moosman bassoons, an old vintage Puckner, and the, the Bell bassoons out of Canada. Those bassoons, you can do more pitch bending. I find you can get a lot more dynamic flexibility, but you have to have a way to control the intonation and the response a little bit more than the bassoons from the column on the left. Now, why does knowing where your bassoon fits into this important for a redesign variables class because the choices that you make in your redesign are going to be offset by the tendencies of your bassoon. So if I play a 7000 series heckle, it's going to bring me 
to the right side of my stability flexibility spectrum. And if I if my goal is to be in the dead center, then I need to make an exceptionally stable read in order to pull me back to the left. If I play on a Walter bassoon, I've got a very stable rock solid bassoon. But if again, if I want to be dead center, then I need to make a more flexible read in order to pull me to that dead center point. We've all had the experience where a friend of ours who plays a completely different bassoon than we do comes up and says, hey, I just made this amazing read. You have to try it. And you put it on your bassoon and it sounds absolutely terrible. Well, the reason for that is because your bassoon might skew to the left or to the right, and they made the read to complement their bassoon, which skews in the other way. For example, if my friend who plays a 14,000 series heckle comes and asks me to try his read on my Fox 201, the read is not going to sound good. It's going to be way too wild and unstable because it's a flexible read on a flexible bassoon. Similarly, if I make a great read for my Yamaha 821 and I give it to my friend who plays a Moosman 222CL, it's not going to sound as good on their bassoon because they're playing a stable read on a stable bassoon. So it's sort of a tug of war and you have to decide where on this spectrum do you want to fit? Do you want to fit dead center or does your job require you to be more to the left or to the right? If it does, then where does your bassoon naturally want to be? And how can you adjust and choose from those redesign variables in order to get where you need to be on this spectrum of stability and flexibility? So why is it important to know this stuff? Why does it matter that we know how the variables in bassoon redesign can affect the way a reed plays? Well, it matters because there are three factors that affect our tone production on the bassoon. The player, us, the instrument itself, and the reed. And of the three, the reed is far and away the easiest one to change. Let's talk about us as a player. Assuming you're doing everything right, assuming you've got a good embouchure, good air support, good articulation, all that stuff, it is very difficult to change yourself. You can make embouchure tweaks, you can change the way you blow, but we're kind of stuck with the physiologies that we have. My lips are shaped a certain way, and unless I'm gonna spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on Botox, which I'm not, I can't really change them. My lungs kind of are the way they are, and I can't change anything about that. Even if you were to go out and gain or lose 400 pounds, you're not going to change who you are as a player uh, as with regards to your physiology. So pl yourself, you are almost impossible to change, assuming, of course, you're doing everything correctly. Changing the bassoon is possible, but very expensive, and it's a rabbit hole that once you start down can be very difficult to emerge from. No bassoon is perfect, we all know this, but for some reason, many people, myself included, have this fantasy that one day we'll find the perfect bassoon and everything will be fixed with our playing. It's not going to happen. Every bassoon, as we said, has its flaws, and once you find a good one, I think your time is probably better spent learning it and figuring out its idiosyncrasies so that the read can be the thing that you can change if you need to compensate for something in yourself or in the bassoon that you're playing on. Reads can be changed. Shapes can be altered, profiles can be altered, wire placements can be altered. All of those things are much easier to change than the instrument or you yourself. Thank you for joining me today on our little overview of bassoon reed design variables. I hope that you learned something and maybe came away with some good information for your own reed making. From Fort Sill, Oklahoma, this has been Staff Sergeant Derek Banish. Happy bassooning and happy reed making.